This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today is Jeffrey Tucker. He's an American libertarian writer, publisher, entrepreneur. He is an advocate of anarcho-capitalism and Bitcoin. He has worked for Ron Paul, the Mises Institute, and Lou Rockwell. It's been a few years since Jeffrey and I spoke, and I asked him on today to specifically talk COVID and the last handful of years. I've been following Jeffrey on Twitter, and I've noticed that he has taken a deep dive into the subject. This is one of those conversations that you might think you know where it's going to go, but you don't. It's an important conversation. It's one that must be had. And for thinking people, for people that want to do the right thing, for people that want to find the honest answers, stay tuned. This is where I go with Jeffrey Tucker. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. I'm going to keep you at this topic that we've all had to live with for the last couple of years, because I don't know exactly why, but from my following you on Twitter, you have kept your finger on the pulse of all things COVID more than a lot of people. And I have a feeling you're going to be able to educate some today. I was in Asia for 2020 and 2021, so I got to witness things here. Let me just throw out a really big picture point to you and see how you handle it. If I think about the last handful of years, specifically how America led and handled the issue of COVID, we're going to get into the nitty gritty and I'm going to pick your mind on all kinds of topics. But big picture, I keep coming back to the word evil. That's the only thing I can leave myself with as a Gen X guy witnessing what just happened in the last handful of years. Is it evil unfurled? Am I completely crazy to reduce it to that? Well, more and more that seems true. And I guess the issue has been whether that was deliberate creation of evil or just sort of evil effects by a bunch of bumbling idiots. It's one of the two or maybe some combination. Why have you stuck with this so much? Why have you really stayed down the rabbit hole? Because I have a feeling you have uncovered and stayed on top of issues and pieces of this whole puzzle that most of us have not. Well, I had a burning curiosity to figure it out, mainly because what happened beginning the second week of March of 2020 shattered my worldview and all my expectations. I had developed in my mind probably arguably Hegelian historiography of our times. It was sort of rooted as a Victorian style liberal naivety, I suppose you could say, of endless progress. And yes, there were plenty of tweaks that needed to be made, but humanity was well on its way towards emancipation, thanks to digital technology and the rise of a sort of well-educated democratic masses were going to hold the feet of the ruling class to the fire, and we're going to get our way. And there was more and more responsiveness between the public and the leaders and that more and more people understood that the world is not a place you can control from the top down, but rather we're entering into a world in which individual freedom was ever more going to triumph. There were things that were happening in 2018 that made me wonder about that. For one thing, the systematic dismantling of the post-war consensus on global trade and so on. And that troubled me, but nothing had prepared me for what happened in 2020, during which time a virus that we knew from reports from late January and, and most of February behaved very much like a textbook respiratory virus. It wasn't actually a threat to most people. We have four coronaviruses circulating in the world and have been endemic for a long time. Now we add a fifth. We get it. We get over it. We upgrade our immune systems. It was no big deal. And that's what everybody was saying in late January and most of February. I don't mean just like Trump. I mean, this was Psychology Today. This was New England Journal of Medicine. This is Fauci. And it all seemed fine. But what happened somewhere starting in late February, a small cabal decided to turn this into kind of an earth shattering event. 
that would lead to the elimination of the Bill of Rights, all the rule of law, and dabble in a level of totalitarian control on a global basis that would have been inconceivable even a few months earlier. And I knew these plans had been there and in place, and I had been writing about them for the previous 16 years, actually, all the way from 2005, I've been writing about pandemic planning and what a threat it was. But, you know, it's one thing to observe that something was potentially bad and another thing to see it actually unfold before your eyes. That was the shock, that the nightmare became the reality. And it really did feel like that to me. The night when the darkness fell in my own mind was March 12th. The travel restrictions just announced in passing in an evening speech by Trump where suddenly you could not travel to England or Australia or Europe, and Europe, England, or Australia could not travel to the United States all in the interest of controlling a virus. Now, those kind of restrictions had previously existed as it pertained to China. That should have been enough of a sign. But that initial restriction on China travel got fed through the prism of American politics. So immediately was criticized by the Democrats and the left as being discriminatory and stereotyping and vicious towards ethnic minorities and all this stuff, which caused, therefore, the right wing to rally around Trump's restrictions. And there we sat. And so the right wing was saying, yeah, we can kick out these Chinese. And the left wing was saying, no, that's vicious towards minorities. And that's kind of where it sat for the better part of six weeks until suddenly the same restrictions pertain to all of Europe and to Australia and to England. And that was the 12th. Now, in that talk by Trump, he said in passing that this also applies to goods. That was not on the teleprompter. That's just what he happened to say. And stock markets reacted. And then the White House put out a clarification the next day. He meant to say it doesn't apply to goods, okay? But that's a heck of an error to make. The very next day, HHS released its, uh, what amounts to a central plan for lockdowns, and Trump signed off on an emergency order that basically put the national security state in charge of the country. We were entering on a military footing. Trump at this point was not entirely aware of what was happening, as best we can reconstruct. So that weekend, he got into huddles with his closest advisors over the weekend, which his closest advisors turned out to be, of course, Kushner. Kushner's two friends out of the tech industry and Deborah Burks, who was the coronavirus coordinator or whatever, having been tapped for that position by the National Security Council, Matthew Pottinger in particular. And, of course, Anthony Fauci. And they got on the phone with Scott Gottlieb, who is a former FDA guy, now on the board of Pfizer and a scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. And it was Gottlieb who strongly recommended severe lockdowns. Trump didn't want to do it, but he got kind of surrounded by these guys. And it never occurred to him to, you know, maybe call up his family doctor or call up one of 10,000 experts on respiratory infections you know, to find out what was actually going on. Instead, he just got bored and got tired and got pushed around and finally just gave the green light to two weeks flat in the curve, which turned out to be a ruse. And everybody knew it at the time. He agreed to the two weeks and then agreed to another two weeks and then to a 30 days. And that was it. That was the window of time. And during that time, the presidency was essentially taken away from him and the country was taken away from us. That's a great rehashing of everything. Once you realized this, though, you yourself, did you take it to a really simple stance of like, the America I once knew is gone? At the time, I thought we still had time to fix it. And in passing, Trump at some point said these restrictions will last for August, which I found was an incredible thing. So people get confused about this a lot. I just want to back up here. But he was talked into destroying what he believed was his greatest creation, which was American prosperity and rising stock market and a functioning economy that was creating a lot of jobs. He was talked and destroying this at his own hand. I think I have a theory about how this happened, but it became very essential for Trump to do it himself, or at least to sign off on it, because in that triangulating moment, it became very difficult for the Republicans to oppose it because it was Trump who did it. For months, they were confused about what they were supposed to believe about this. And a lot of it came down to the fact that this was an import from China. People were 
very happy to sort of go along with the war on the virus because they thought it was like a war on China, which Trump had already warmed up all the right wing for that sort of thing. This triangulating thing, if you know what I mean by that term, what I mean is that a political leader does the thing that you least likely expect him to do and therefore causing chaos within his own ideological ranks. This is essentially what happened. In 1948, when Truman decided that Russia was the enemy, this was after having been allied with Russia in the war. And that really confused the Republicans because they had been saying for years that FDR was being manipulated by Stalin. They were just feeling some sense of schadenfreude, so they went along with it. The next thing you know, you have 70-year-long Cold War. And it happened in 1972 when Nixon, Richard Nixon, anti-commie, against the Chai Coms, went to China and, and negotiated a peace deal. Republicans didn't know what to do with that. And then it was also Nixon who imposed the EPA, which Republicans didn't know what to do with that because they were against regulations. But here's Nixon doing it. So this is the way you get things done in Washington. You have to pick people to do the unexpected thing and therefore confound their own ideological base. This is also what happened in the 1990s with Clinton's welfare reform. It was he who stopped the flow of cash to single moms and imposed a sort of work requirement for receiving welfare. That confused his party, and so on it goes. Well, this is what happened in 2020 when Trump signed off on the most egregious attacks on American liberty in our lifetime. So the churches were closed, the schools were closed, the small businesses were destroyed, large big box stores were kept open, the hospitals were restricted, dentistry was basically shut down. Every one of the Bill of Rights was just absolutely shredded, and Trump did it. It confused a lot of people. Now, pretty quickly after Trump signed off on the orders, he began to sort of suspect that something was wrong, and he didn't like it. So he made this big announcement that we would definitely reopen the country by Easter. And people were very optimistic about that. But if you look back at the timing of that, he signed off on two weeks to flatten the curve. When he said will be open by Easter. That was a week beyond the two weeks to flatten the curve. So with that announcement, we'd be open by Easter. What he was really saying, whether he intended this or not, was he's open to more restrictions. He's open to an extension of the lockdowns. And that signaled his advisors, namely Deborah Birx and Anthony Fauci, to believe that they could talk him into more. At this moment, did Trump have fear that the virus was somehow or another far worse and that if he didn't go along with these decisions, 10% of the population could die or something crazy like that? Or was it just something else that the horse had left the barn and he went along with it? What was going on in his thinking? So this is a little bit speculative because early on he was saying this is a flu, it's going to come in and go, you'll see. And he was right about that. His initial instincts were 100% correct. Somehow they got to him a lot of it traces to the March 8th testimony by Fauci and some subcommittee of the Senate, in which Fauci was throwing around the possibility of a 10% mortality. He finally, at the end of the testimony, reduced it to 1%, which he said would be 10 times worse than the annual flu. Everybody in the room, the blood drained out of their faces, and they were convinced that they're going to be responsible for the death of all their constituencies. So that was a real switch. So you're right about that, that by the time... March 12th, 13th, 14th, and 15th came along, Trump was beginning to think this is going to be far worse. And what's interesting about that, the environment within the Oval Office and with Washington and media culture in general, and the New York Times was a major contributor to this, the thing became such a hothouse of this unified opinion that a disaster was on its way that hardly anybody could think their way around it. I mean, it just became so overwhelming. Let me take you back to a foundational issue, at least in my mind, as a Gen X guy who was in high school, 83, 4, 5, 6. I was going to a Catholic school at the time, and that was right at the epicenter of Fauci's first act of scaring the bejesus out of everybody. Have you, in your mind, connected these dots? At least I feel like this was just the second round of getting an entire population deathly afraid of a virus where the people in the know knew that there were particular high-risk groups, but they didn't care because they needed to get everybody scared to get whatever solution they wanted. This whole idea of lockdowns to deal with a new pathogen traces to about 2005. So the first Bush administration, once the avian bird flu came along, 
Bush was an apocalyptic style president. You recall that he dealt with 9-11. So he was already predisposed to believe that there was a disaster around every corner. So when they came to him and said, there's an avian bird flu, and he said, well, I need a plan to deal with it. So some people came to him and said, well, what we should do is live with the virus, let the virus circulate. People will get sick and then get over it, and we'll move on with life. And there's not a lot we know about the avian bird flu. We don't know about its transmissibility. There's a lot more we can know before we can give you a plan. And Bush said, that is not good enough. So he then went to his bioterrorism section, this sleepy little section of the White House, ruled by this guy named Rajiv Vinkalia. Vinkala, I guess it was Rajiv Vinkala, who called me, told me to stop writing the jerk. But anyway, that's 15 years later. He was the guy who invented this idea of pandemic planning. And the idea was that we keep everybody apart through social distancing and closures, school closures, business closures. And through their models, they came up with a model. And one of the guys who came up with the model was Robert Glass over at the Sandia National Laboratories with his daughter, who, you know, was deathly afraid of cooties. Anyway, they put together this plan for nationwide lockdowns. And Bush himself gave several press conferences. We're going to deliver the food to you, but you've got to stay home. Everything's going to be closed. The virus is coming. Just prepare. The military is going to take care of everything. So he had everything lined up. And it was funny because I was writing about it in those days. I was screaming at the time, like, did you just hear what this guy said? They're actually considering basically throwing out all principles of civilized life under conditions of what they believe is a pathogenic attack. I couldn't get any traction for my articles. People just said, you should stop writing about this because this is just dumb. Um, it'll never happen. Well, the avian bird flu, well, Fauci at the time was warning that it had a 50% mortality rate. The world expert on the avian bird flu said that half of humanity is going to die from this thing. But it turned out the avian bird flu never hopped from birds to humans. Never did. Let me keep you at this big picture, though, for a moment. And I've already brought it up a couple times. Where do you feel like you are now? Like, what is America now after what we've just seen? And I'm going to take you on some other side tangents here in a second. But where are we? What are we now after witnessing what happened in 2020? After witnessing vaccine rollouts, all the misinformation that came out on the vaccines, and you know, if we were to poll half the country today, half the country probably thinks that the vaccines stopped the spread and kept them from dying. We're like living in this world of parallel universes where people don't even have any idea what the facts are. Age of truth, age of lies. The masses believe the lies and they are absolutely everywhere. We also live in unprecedented times where you can find the truth. I mean, the fact that we can talk like this and people can listen to it is without precedent. I mean, the fact that you can watch Tucker Carlson on Fox. But you and I might not have been able to have this conversation and have it go out on a podcast a year or two ago, and there's a very good chance I would have been taken off Apple's podcast platform and whatnot. Yeah, that's very likely true. But there's nothing they can do at least for now, about suppressing this true history of what happened to us. So it's one of the exciting things about Twitter files and all these things that's happening. We're finding out, looking backwards in time, precisely what happened to us. And my map of what happened to us looks something like this. It seems as if a junta within the administrative state, by which I mean the unelected state, the permanent bureaucracy, mostly associated with national intelligence. The deep state. The deep state decided to seize control from the elected politicians in this country, among whom Trump, but really the entire patina of democracy that overlays the actual ruling class underneath. And they decided that we've had enough of this nonsense. Now is the time for shock and awe. And they used the virus as the excuse to obtain that. If I say there were plans in place to do this, it sounds like a conspiracy theory. It's ridiculous. There were probably 20 or so germ games that had been conducted for the previous 10 years, two of which had taken place in 2019, Crimson Contagion and Event 201, both of which were funded by the Gates Foundation and the World Economic Forum and were participated in by all the big pharma companies and the pharmacies and all the big tech companies and the National Security Council and the entire bioterrorism bureaucracy within the executive departments and the universities. So they were running these germ games. And as part of the germ games, they always concluded the same way. There's a new pathogen. Oh, no, what do we do? Well, first, let's censor the press, close the businesses, shut the schools, 
keep the kids out of the school for six weeks, make everybody stay home, introduce travel restrictions, and just basically completely smash a civilized life. All the germ games had the exact same plan. And one of them, this Crimson Contagion thing, headed up by Robert Cadlick, top bioterrorism expert, but also a medical doctor. He was running the Crimson Contagion one all the way through. Their final report came out in November of 2019. So a perfect overlay with the coronavirus, which we know had been circulating in the United States and North America generally since at least October. So we had had COVID everywhere in Canada and the United States for six months prior to the lockdowns. Cadillac, who ran the Crimson Contagion, just so happened to be the guy tapped to lead the COVID response. One day, he's put a close in the book on Crimson Contagion, wakes up the next day, he's running the COVID response. You've dug into the Twitter files. I've seen bits and pieces of things. What are the most interesting, egregious pieces of information to come out of the Twitter files that you've examined that really would cause somebody who doesn't want to believe what you might have to say, who is completely in their ideological silo, believes that the vaxes stop the spread? What are some of the things that have come out of the Twitter files that would cause people that bought the entire Fauci narrative to pause? Well, I have to say there has not been one revelation to come out of the Twitter files that surprised me even slightly. Well, that's you. You're up to speed, though. <laughs> yeah, I knew all this was true. But what we saw, what we're seeing with the Twitter files is that the administrative state was working hand in glove with all the big tech companies to impose one way of thinking and shut everybody else down. It wasn't algorithms that were working. It was definitely... All day, every day, silence this person, take off this post, get rid of this guy. Don't allow anybody to say this following thing. And all these companies were ready to go. One of the things that was a little bit surprising was just how brazen it was. The FBI was paying employees at Twitter for their time because they were exhausted. Like, hey, we can't just spend all of our lives doing FBI work. Like, I have an actual job here. And so the FBI said, oh, good point, good point. We'll start paying you now. So they paid millions of dollars, to Twitter to basically compensate their employees for working for the FBI. And that's what was going on there. And this was thousands and thousands of people. So when Musk came in and he fired four out of five employees, is because he didn't know which ones were actually deep state actors. But there was a lot more than anybody knew. So I would say that it was far more extreme than we knew. I mean, it's funny because my own account had been throttled for a very long time. I was never blocked. It was kind of interesting that they never actually banned me. Shadow banning was like a mythological creature for a long time until we saw the screenshots once Musk bought it and we could see that it was an actual button they could press. Yeah. Well, it was funny because I got unthrottled and immediately my reach went up 175% and my followers have doubled. But I had been screaming into the wilderness for two years and it had been demoralizing. And it was very difficult to find people who were opposed to this. Now, Going back to March, I was devastated. After March 11th, which was the first lockdown, so the first lockdowns in the United States happened in Austin, Texas, when the conference called South by Southwest was shut down by the mayor by administrative edict. I mean, some idiot, some mayor just tapped, you know, but he didn't know what he was doing. But he just closed the conference on his own will. And I was writing about it. This is outrageous. This is an American. You can't do this. But I was pretty much alone. As far as I knew, there were people out there, my tribe, that I considered myself a member of my tribe called the so-called libertarians. I expected that they would rise up. They've been preparing for this for decades, right? Well, they went completely silent. There wasn't a word out of Institute for Humane Studies, the Mount Pelham Society, Philadelphia Society, the Cato Institute. The Libertarian Party somehow couldn't rally itself to say anything against this. So it's the Students for Liberty sent out all sorts of press releases, stay home, stay safe. And then, of course, Marginal Revolution, Tyler Cowan, you know, was all for the lockdowns and saying lockdowns is the greatest way to handle the virus. And so I was shocked. I just felt completely alone, abandoned by my own tribe. So as I began to write about this, I had to find new allies wherever I could. But it was very difficult because even from those days, it was controlled. So you had my tribe, the libertarians who you expect to be against all this stuff, completely went silent just out of confusion because 
theoretical confusion, cowardice. I don't know what it was. Maybe they're being paid by FTX for all I know. So I had to find new allies, but it took me the better part of three or four months, during which time I was getting calls from these big shots within the national security, biosecurity state machinery telling me to shut up. I'm like, shut up. I have lived my whole life for this thing. So I began to write furiously. Yeah, once or twice a day, I was putting out articles on the history of infectious diseases, the proper approach of a free society to pathogenic spread and all this kind of stuff. And some of those articles went viral. I mean, it's funny because Zuckerberg accidentally let one through as my article. You probably bumped into it. Everybody has on how Woodstock occurred in the middle of a pandemic. Okay, so I wrote that article and went through the whole epidemiological history of the Hong Kong flu of 1968-69. And the fact checker said it was true. And then Zuckerberg let it through and it got millions of views and that sort of thing. So that definitely made me a target. Anyway, I couldn't find allies really anywhere. Your Twitter didn't get canceled, though. You never crossed the line? For some reason, I never actually got my Twitter account blocked, but I did get it seriously throttled. And there's no question that my direct messages were being monitored and that sort of thing. Come September, who imagined that this thing would last that long? And there we were in September still dealing with this nonsense. And I reached out to Martin Kuhldorf over at Harvard. I said, look, why don't we get together? This is crazy. And he said, yeah, let's do it. So he came over and we hung out. I invited a few friends. And we just hung out for the day. And then after that was when he said, why don't we hold an event to teach the press about about public health principles and to explain virology, explain immunology, because for whatever reason, the media is really falling down here. They're not doing what they're supposed to do. So let's just give them an education. I say, that sounds like a good idea. So I've got some experts in. I began to call media up. Hey, I've got some experts over here. Why don't we come and meet? And we'll have little training sessions, teaching sessions, some question and answer time. Well, nobody wanted to come. When you talk about the media falling down, so you've already talked about the money going to the Twitter people. My working assumption is the vast majority of the so-called press in the Washington, D.C. area are on the take or are directed to report in a certain way. I mean, everything feels ideological when I pick up any media in America. So it feels like that bureaucratic state, that deep state directs everything. I don't know that it should be a surprise that no, quote, media wanted to show up and hang out with you. At the time, it did feel like we were living in the midst of something like martial law. It felt like that, but it was hard to prove that it was true. So I didn't know if it was true or not, but it certainly felt like it. I didn't realize the extent to which it was happening, that we were really losing any semblance of constitutional government or democracy or freedom and all that kind of it was all already gone. Then you had the Black Lives Matter protests, which happened in the summer. That was just sort of a safety valve. People are tired of staying home and they're miserable. So let's let them go out and protest for a cause that is politically aligned with us. And so that began the realignment. And the press in those days was like, well, they're not spreading coronavirus because they're wearing masks. And the other thing is that there's another pandemic out there. It's called racism. And in some ways, racism is even worse than COVID. So that should have been a clue. <laughs> Something was really wrong in this country. Anyway, we decided to put together this little event of teaching, and I couldn't get anybody to come. I did get one freelancer for the British Medical Journal, uh, David Zweig, who's a freelancer for The Atlantic. And then my friend John Tamney from Real Clear Markets, those are the only three journalists who showed up. Free speech. So here we have, coming out of the Twitter files, we can see the FBI is paying millions of dollars to suppress speech. How does this work from a legal perspective? I'm the average American, or I'm somebody on Twitter. I've been throttled via the government going through the proxy of Twitter employees that falls apart in a court system. Everybody can see what happens. Where do we go with this First Amendment freedom of speech thing now that we've got the deep state essentially either paying or directing assorted social media creations and who knows what else to just shut people up? What's the recourse? Is there a recourse? It's being fought in the courts right now, and this is all a little bit 
anticlimactic and a little bit even boring, but the state's attorney general for Missouri and Louisiana are really deep now into the discovery phase of a lawsuit that says that this is all contrary to the First Amendment. Evidence is absolutely overwhelming. All the depositions are being given by everybody. Fauci can't remember anything. It's the usual crap. But the amount of evidentiary support for the plaintiffs in this case, who happen to be Brownstone scholars, by the way, Bhattacharya and Aaron Kiriati and Martin Kruldorf are the main plaintiffs, and there are a few others, but they will win the case. And the court will rule against the Biden administration, against the administrative bureaucracies, and for the plaintiffs. And that will be the opinion, and it will be a long opinion, and it'll be done. And the New York Times will report it. The Wall Street Journal will have a passing mention on the editorial page. The sub stacks will blow up. I'll write 10 articles about it. The question is, what happens after that? Well, the defendants will appeal. The appeal will take six months. And then it'll either be reversed or it'll be upheld, but then it'll be appealed again. Or maybe not. They can't let this precedent survive. But now we're talking a year, maybe a year and a half. At that point, we're going to be five years or so after the damage is already done. And let's just say that after this enormous thicket of litigation, that the courts decide against the Biden administration and the administrative state, what happens then? What are the penalties? Who pays who? What are the damages? Who gets what? What happens then? What's to prevent it? So what's interesting about this is I think the answer to that is nothing happens. Yeah, exactly. There is no enforcement apparatus that is going to stop this from happening again. And I can prove it by telling you the lawsuit is going very well for the good guys right now. We've got thousands, if not tens of thousands of exhibits proving that this is an attack on the First Amendment. We're pretty sure that there's no way that the judges can ever decline to recognize the truth of the plaintiff's claims. But even now, the censorship continues. We know this. I mean, Facebook is heavily controlled. I have to post a cat picture on my posts and then bury my links to my articles in the comments. I linked to a CDC article February of 2022 on Facebook, and they suspended me for a couple of weeks or something. That was my last serious post on Facebook. Now I just linked my podcast there, but I gave up on it. That first moment, and I guess... I don't know if this has happened to you or not, but have you ever been censored? That was my first time as an American where I've been censored. And I was like, why am I participating with this guy's business, Facebook? What am I doing here? Well, they're supposed to be serving us. Instead, they're serving the government. And we're just only there to provide anodyne content so they can serve up their ads and make money. That's the whole model. It happened. My first censorship experience was with LinkedIn. They just started taking down my posts. And I began to complain about it. And immediately, it was very interesting. I got all sorts of communications from people who work for LinkedIn writing me going, this isn't right, this isn't right. You definitely need to appeal this. So like an idiot, the first time I actually took the bait, I said, oh, I'm going to appeal. And they said, well, your appeal is rejected. They pretend to have some court. <laughs> it's just silly. So then after that, one in every five posts of mine on LinkedIn was taken down. I never was suspended for whatever reason. I don't know why. Let me take it back to a name that you've brought up several times so far. And I brought him up speaking to my early high school days because I just see a lot of parallels on how Fauci handled AIDS and how he handled COVID. But let's just stay at Fauci and COVID for a moment. What is your takeaway from watching that guy in action? If there comes down the pike a virus that is truly deadly, that guy single handedly destroyed trust. The great mystery is why he changed his mind about COVID, because he had been working in early February on an article that came out in the New England Journal of Medicine. The article was a mess. It had mathematical errors, had all kinds of problems. There was none less printed. And basically, the upshot was that this is the flu. And by the time the article actually appeared, which was uh, February 28th, probably at this point, they were still doing like a two-week, three-week lead time. Fauci had already changed his mind. He changed his mind somewhere between February 27th and February 28th. And the first indication of this was an email that he wrote to Morgan Fairchild. The blonde actress? Yeah, the va va voom, you know, she played Dottie on Pee Wee's Big Adventure, and I think she was on Dallas and all this kind of stuff. So Fauci, you know, is trying to figure out how to contact influencers. <laughs> so he has to go back to Morgan Fairchild. It's the only one he knew. 
He writes her a note and says, hey, listen, you need to prepare your followers for lockdowns, for business closures and everything shut down and that sort of thing. That was his first reach out to Morgan Fairchild? The first one, yeah. First one to the public, oh yes. God. Something happened in those 48 hours between February 26th and February 28th, and that was the turning point. Something happened. Talk all day about exactly what happened and why. But that was the turning of the tide. And then it was also the New York Times on February 28th. It was February 27th, actually. Um, I had an interview with Donald G. McNeil, who is their lead virus reporter, who's just himself, you know, brilliant, but hysteric. One of these guys has been waiting for the next pandemic for like two decades or something. So he went on the podcast with Michael Barbaro, a podcast that goes out to the elites, two or three million people, mostly New York, mostly upper class, ruling class people arrived at the interview with a bottle of hydrogen peroxide and was spraying it all over the table <laughs> and said, one in six of your friends is going to die from this virus. This is so bad. Worse than the pandemic of 1918. And he was saying all these things. I was lying in bed listening to this. You know, I told you that the darkness fell for me March 12th. Actually, that was the day the darkness fell for me because I knew there's no way the New York Times would be running such a wild, hysterical freak out podcast that contradicted a hundred years of New York Times publishing on pandemics. When 68 came, they said, everybody calm down, it's going to go away. When 57, 58 came with the Asian flu, they said, everybody relax, just if you get sick, go to your doctor, otherwise we'll get through this, that sort of thing. 41, 42, 43, the polio pandemic, New York Times is like, everybody stay relaxed, we're going to figure this out. This is the way New York Times has been. So suddenly on February 27th, 2020, they were completely changed 100 years of tradition and calming people down and instead decided to whip people up. And the next day, the same guy, Donald G. McNeil, wrote an article for the New York Times called, to take on the coronavirus, we have to go medieval on it. So he's calling for the highways to be shut, the planes to be grounded, everybody to be locked into their disease-ridden cities and restricted in their movements. So the motivations here, let me in my own mind here, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but it seems like the motivations early on, oh, wow, here's an opportunity. And different groups saw different potential opportunities, but it seems like the two opportunities they saw, the consolidation of power and vaccine money. Okay, so let's just tick through possible things that might be motivating this. I don't have a single theory to advance above everything else, but one just on the more granular level, Fauci was responsible for funding gain of function research at the Wuhan lab where they believed this virus had leaked out of. He thought that this is possibly a bioweapon. He knew that because he was probably involved in sort of bioweapon gain of function research and figured that a lot of people were going to die from it. It'd all be traced back to him and his grant giving decisions. So he and Farrar from the UK just decided to introduce chaos, or possibly they believe that this virus was going to be so prevalent and so severe. Those two things are not possible. They can't go together. Unless they could build a virus in a long latency period, which they didn't. It was not 14 days like they claimed. It was more like two or three. But let's just say that they really believe that this is going to be the killer virus. Then the lockdowns were the response. So that's my first possible theory. The second theory is that Trump had to go. The administrative state just had had it with him, maybe as a response to his war on China with the tariffs and the destruction of the post-war neoliberal consensus in the world with declining tariffs. He was destroying the world trading order, so they had to get rid of Trump because they thought he was a crazy man. And this was the best plan. And you can imagine people sitting around a room going, look, the Russia thing failed, the Ukraine thing failed, what's next? And then Fauci was there. He said, well, we've always got a pandemic. So that's the second theory. How that second theory fits in with the first theory, I don't really know. The third one is the pharma view. Big pharma already owns most of the regulatory agencies. They fund more than half of the FDA at this point. They own governments all over the world. Their power is just hegemonic at this point. And they really needed to sell a product. And we know this. It's true that they've been working on the virus from the middle of January. Trump brags that Operation War Speed broke all records, and I really got this vaccine out in record time. That's nonsense. He didn't do anything. They were already sequencing the genome for this virus in January and were very quickly rolling out a vaccine. The vaccine could have come out as early as the summer, really. 
they delayed the vaccine because they didn't want Trump to get credit for it. And there's a reason it was released within two days after the election in November. So that's the third part. It's just purely a vaccine racket. How that fits in with the anti-Trump thing and my previous theory on Fauci and the gain of function research, I don't know. Where are we in terms of what you've seen in terms of side effects, vax side effects? There's a lot of information out there, and I've not had a chance to personally dig through it all. But what is your best handle on where we are? I think that's a good way to ask the question. I think we all have this question because in our minds, we toggle between two extremes. You know, on one hand, you have people out there going, there's some side effects. Or it's a very small minority. For most people, it's done a lot of good and so on. The problem with that position, let's say it's true, the side effects are really minimal and mostly mild. The vaccine was not necessary for 99% of people. It just wasn't. You did not need to be vaccinated against COVID. The vaccines never give the amount of protection that you're going to get from natural immunity. We knew this years ago. We've known this for decades. We've known this for arguably two and a half thousand years. So the vaccine was not necessary for the vast number of people. And I'm going to pretend for a moment as if it was necessary for the vulnerable population above the age of, say, 70. So why would you put up with any side effects from a medicine that you didn't need to take in the first place? I asked that question to a friend the other day, and he kind of had that cognitive dissonance look in his eyes like, oh, well, well, (laughs) didn't want to think about it. So the answer to that is that the vaccines are necessary to achieve herd immunity. So whether you need it personally or not, you have to get it so that the whole community can be protected. That's the idea. That was the logic thrown at us. But of course, that's highly contingent upon an empirical proposition that they really do stop spread and stop infection, which they don't. So the herd immunity excuse for the vaccines in this case completely is out the window, completely shattered. In other words, there's zero public health benefit to these vaccines. Unlike smallpox, unlike measles. These vaccines achieve nothing in order to get us to herd immunity. This much we know for sure. So there's that. On the other side, there's people out there, and I have friends in this camp, you know, Paul, Alexander, Naomi, what's they say? This is a genocide. This is probably a depopulation agenda. The side effects are awful. Women might not be able to have kids. They're draining men of their testosterone. People are dying left and right. Most of the vast numbers of excess deaths are due to the vaccine. That's what this camp says. Now, I'm glad to hold out the possibility that they're right. I just have not yet been fully persuaded that that's correct. In other words, I don't know how they could know that. Now, their intuition may be very powerful, and they may ultimately prove correct. I'll just tell you this. Two nights ago, I was having dinner with a hematologist, chief scientific director of the nation's largest healthcare providing services. He's bought and sold many companies. He's a just while he's walking geniuses with a lifetime of experience in medicine. And I asked him a series of questions, one of which was, how bad is this? And he said to me, his read on this is that the adverse effects of the vaccine are somewhere between 10 and 100 times more prevalent than in any vaccine that's ever been approved to be on the market. Why is that? Is there an easy enough explanation for us peasants to understand? That discrepancy? In 1974, they pulled the avian bird flu, another avian bird flu vaccine after like eight deaths. So they just pulled that up. This is very bad. So all vaccines are dangerous to some extent. The other question is whether or not the benefits exceed the cost. But the cost of this one, he says, are between 10 and 100 times worse. So they should be pulled. In other words, these should not be in the market. This is from a guy who got the vax because he believed in it. And in the early days, he had no idea. This man had no idea just the sheer malice behind or the corruption. He just didn't know about it. But he also confirmed something that I had read many times, but we're both the same. You read things, you don't know whether to believe them, or you believe them, but you don't know for sure that they're true. I asked him about this whole question of the EUA, the emergency use authorization and the conditions under which it happened. He said that Part of the law, and this is what Robert Kennedy Jr. says, part of the law is that you can't have alternatives to the vaccine and get an EUA. So you have to rule out the possibility that there's other ways to deal with the virus. Like the ivermectin I took in 2021. Yeah, exactly. So ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine were already off the markets by late 2019. They already started withdrawing them from the markets to prepare the way for the vaccine. I wasn't in America, so I actually had the luxury to still buy the products. 
Oh, yeah. Well, I was just in Mexico and I loaded up on ivermectin when I was there, got back and gave it already out to everybody. So, you know, there's probably not a reason for young, healthy people to take ivermectin. I had tested positive and I figured, well, you know, what the hell? Yeah, no, it's fine. I mean, you probably reduce the number of days you're going to suffer from it. So it's a very effective drug. And he, this doctor I was talking to has been prescribing hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin for decades as safe, effective medicines for these kinds of viruses. So it wasn't anything magical about this. And in fact, there was no real reason to do random controlled trials, although they should have, but they didn't. They took them off the markets and said they don't work so that they could pass through this emergency use authorization nonsense for these vaccines. And that's also why the state of emergency is ongoing. You say that so diplomatically and so nicely, but what you just said should cause infinite rage for thinking people. Infinite rage. I mean, it's just unbelievable that they did this. I guess it's not unbelievable. They did it. I mean, these are the kinds of people that exist. This is why I started this conversation with the word evil. I don't know where else to put my mind except in the direction of evil. Yeah. And also it's a gradual dawning. So I've been hearing this story about ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine now for going on three years. And I heard Robert Kennedy Jr. say, well, they had to get him off the market to prepare the way for the EUA. And I thought, yeah, that's right. And I asked somebody else about that. And so he said, oh, that's not quite correct because there was no other vaccine on the market. Therefore, they were able to get to a therapeutic is not the same thing as a vaccine. Well, there's a problem because the vaccine turns out to be basically a therapeutic at best. And the person I asked the question to previously was a biostatistician and an academic. This guy is an actual owner of huge healthcare companies and a practicing hematologist and like a really well-connected medical doctor. These are very different kinds of positions. And he said, absolutely, they had to get rid of hydroxychloroquine and, and ivermectin to pave the way for the EUA or the EUA would have never gone through. And this is also why they're releasing vaccines for kids who have basically zero level mortality. I think it's like 0 0.00003 between the ages of 0 and 19 the infection fatality rate for this virus. And they still want to get these stupid vaccines. The reason for that, maybe you know, is because if they can get the vaccine to kids, they can get it on the childhood schedule. Make money. Well, it's also indemnification. So if they get it on the childhood schedule, they're indemnified from any legal liability. Such shitty people. The big picture, too. Can this game that's been played in the last handful of years. Can you imagine this game being played again now that the trust is so broken? Meaning if they tried to go for lockdowns again, if they tried to mandate vaccination, it just seems like there's too many people that have now seen behind the curtain, as you described so nicely in this conversation, they might not be able to play this game again, at least maybe not for a generation. So it's interesting the way you put that, but I don't think we know for sure anymore what enough means in that case. You, you're saying you and I are like fringe characters? No, I don't think we're fringe. I think we're about 35%, maybe going on 40%, who are incredulous about this entire regime and what it's done. That's pretty high. Is it high enough? I don't know. There are things happening in the world today that make me think maybe they went too far and that they're having to chop off the heads of the top lockdowners and mandators right off the bat. The guy who started all this in this country, namely Donald J. McNeil, the New York Times, that's the guy, they chopped his head off. I don't know if you remember that, but what they said was that six years previously, he was on a trip uh, with interns in Chile, and he used, in the course of a dinner conversation, used the N-word. He was taken off the playing field. He got his head on a platter. And that was the first sign to me that they were all going down one by one. And then sure enough, he was fired. And then the great hero, Andrew Cuomo, the governor of New York, he put his hand on the back of a lady on an elevator one time. So he's got to go. They got his brother, too. And they got his brother, too, because he was defending him on scene. And so they've been chopping off heads all the time. And it's the most prominent of the lockdowners that they're killing one by one. And then yesterday, of course, Jacinda Ardu from New Zealand was forced to resign. So on one hand, I think these are victories. On the other hand, 
I'm not prepared to say that just yet. It seems to me what you have here is deep state actors giving the mob their most vulnerable people who are stupid enough to lead the public charge and became public figures for lockdowns. And now they're just killing them one by one. As if to give the masses some blood, some heads on platters. That's the idea. This has been going on now for two and a half years, basically. So there's two ways to look at this. On one hand, the fact that Arduin has gone or that McNeil's fired or that the Cuomo's are dead, that doesn't change the power structure behind everything that happened here. It doesn't disrupt the National Security Council or the Department of Homeland Security. On the other hand, the fact that it's necessary that they keep killing these people is a reflection of the change in public opinion. I think on one hand, there's good reason to be optimistic about this because it's an indication of what they have to do in order to retain their power. But we shouldn't be naive to believe that Erdern or McNeil or the Cuomo's or any of the rest of these people, or Burks for that matter, who was also similarly sacrificed, as you recall, that they were really the ones in charge. They were just the people dumb enough to pipe up and become the face of the lockdowns where they're all dying one by one. So they're having to kill them because of this 40% maybe of public anger. But that does not diminish their power. The administrative deep state apparatus is still very much in control, more so than ever. Even among the 40%, very few among our tribe is aware of the extent of the problem it's not about who we're electing. They're just marionettes. The problem is much deeper. It's the permanent bureaucratic class that's really ruling the world now on a global basis. And I don't like to talk like a paranoid person, but this is just the reality. And they're very much in control right now. The courts can't control them. The voters can't control them. Nobody can control them. They own most of the media, control most of the tech companies. This little period of thousand flowers blooming over at Twitter is really unusual. We should really take advantage of it as far as I know. But Twitter itself still has massive people embedded there of the deep state. So the problems are deep and intractable. And how th this ends is an interesting question. You're sort of asking, do we have enough democratically based opposition to resist the lockdowns the next time? I think the answer to that is no, we don't. It's going to happen is that a couple of years are going to go by. During which time, the World Health Organization is going to get its treaty passed. The deep state's going to consolidate control. They're going to look back at this little time of the last six months and say, gee, what did we do wrong? How can we plug these holes the next time? And in two years' time, they're going to do it all over again. At this time, they're not going to miss their target. They missed their target this time. They tried vaccine mandates and vaccine passports. They wanted to get them passed. They got halfway there. People got angry. They said, okay, we're going to retrench for a little while. Give us two years, and we're going to hit it again. They're not going to relent. I, I would love to believe the fantasy that they're all scared now, the public and angry mobs. They're not. Not yet. I got one final question for you. You mentioned your tribe several times. Perhaps I'm in the tribe too. You've used the term libertarian. You mentioned Tyler Cohen. I can also recognize, because I've had like six or seven George Mason libertarian economist on this podcast, but there's something wrong with the tribe. What tribe are you in today? Because the tribe that you've <laughs> long held yourself out to be in, the intellectual tribe that you saw, and this is the one that I saw myself being in too, but look where I'm living now and look my beliefs said, it, things have changed. So what is the tribe and who are the members? And who are the allies to be associated with? I'm not sure anymore. I don't have an answer to that question, but I will tell you that I'm forging ahead anyway. Brownstone is doing very, very well. We have easily more traffic than all the Washington think tanks and every other so-called libertarian institution out there. So we're doing very well. And if you look at the writings, well, let me just put it this way. I have quite a gang that's writing for me. It's a very impressive gang. We have fellows, we have conferences, we have monthly supper clubs. I've got an email list. You know, the one thing we don't talk about, political theory. <laughs> we just don't talk about it. Not because we're avoiding the topic, because it's boring. Everybody agrees on the central point that we need something approximating enlightened values, freedom, and democracy. But beyond that, where do you find that and how do you find that, right? Yeah. I mean, brownstone.org is what I founded in 2021, in part because 
but I tried but failed me completely. And I felt like we needed something new. And most of my writers traditionally considered themselves on the left, but they don't consider themselves on the left anymore. Some of them, you know, come from the right. They don't consider themselves on the right anymore. So we're just trying to forge a new way outside the normal ideological categories. I thought you were going to ask me what I think went wrong with the libertarians. And that's an issue. Essentially, that's what I was asking. What is your perspective on that? Well, let's say three big failures. One was historical failure that even though they imagine themselves to be all sophisticated and knowledgeable about yada, yada. And deliver chance so I was congratulating themselves for their intelligence. They didn't know anything about the history of pandemic disease as much as the response. Libertarians know a lot about economics and know a lot about political theory, but they don't know anything about the history of pathogens, which is a very important chapter in the development of civilization that they just got bored by. They got intimidated by the science, so they decided to leave it to others to comment on. The other problem is that these idiots take recourse to what emerged over the 1990s to this thing called the non-aggression principle, NAP, I think they call it, which is a simplistic and self-referential, undefined postulate, you know, axiom. And they, from their easy chairs, decided that for anybody else to infect you with a virus constitutes aggression. Therefore, the government was doing the right thing by keeping everybody apart. That thinking is so stupid that I've never addressed it. Restate that again, just so everyone can follow that logic. It's a really tortured bit of logic. <laughs> it's so embarrassing. The idea, and smart people weren't saying this, the idea is that libertarianism is against aggression. It's aggression to be responsible for spreading a virus. Therefore, while we're against the government in general, to the extent the government is doing things that are minimizing the role of aggression, society is doing the right thing. Therefore, lockdowns to stop pathogenic spread are consistent with libertarianism. That's what they said. That's the biggest amount of mental masturbation I could imagine. Yeah, this is what they all said it. And it's just dumb because, of course, they're forgetting the positive externality that comes from exposure. And the positive externalities for the overwhelming number of population in most of history, with some exceptions, have been generally positive from exposure to pathogens. We live with them. Your immune systems and apps. The only thing on the planet Earth that's more dangerous than governments is a naive immune system. And we know this from history. When the Spanish colonial powers arrived in the late 1400s into the New World, they brought smallpox with them to a naive population, and smallpox probably killed half the people in the New World, both in what's now Mexico and in what's now the United States. It was a complete disaster. So naive immune systems are responsible for mass death, which is to say, if you extend the principle of social distancing on a global basis, you're potentially slaughtering millions of people. It's a very dangerous thing to have a naive immune system. The other side of this is that exposure is responsible for mass death among immunologically naive populations. But it's also responsible for vast life extension among the people who survive it. So there's a reason we saw that hockey stick in the late 1800s and then all through the 20th century in which we began to live longer, healthier, happier lives. And that was due to global pathogenic exposure from improved travel technology and then World War I, especially. So the positive externalities from exposure are there. The libertarians just somehow never considered that. One final point about libertarians. There's a very disturbing darker element here. And it's not just theoretical failings. This company called FTX was set up in 2019, most likely to, as a money laundering service for a lockdown pharmaceutical interests. But they, under the influence of this guy named William McCaskill, who was kind of a big shot Oxford University philosopher, who wrote several books about long-termism and effective altruism and all this nonsense, had given basically Sam Bankman Freed the rationale for getting very rich and giving all of his money away, Sam Bankman fried was telling everybody, and McCaskill was too, back in 2020 and following, that he was going to give away a billion dollars. You can follow all the links there. Bankman fried and McCaskill experienced loving interviews on Tyler Cowen's podcast. Tyler Cowen was reviewing McCaskill's books favorably in the New York Times. They were a very tight-knit group. When IHS got involved, Institute for Humane Studies got involved with this whole thing in 2020. They started giving grants under Tyler's influence to Neil Ferguson, 
for his great uh, epidemiological modeling. So there is an element of pure financial corruption here that has not been fully explored. My intuition tells me this played a much larger role than anybody has yet acknowledged. It is a longer and deeper conversation. I find myself these days, and this is the non-academic guy who writes a bunch of books, but I find myself still with these libertarian perspectives, but I feel like a guy who wants to fight. And sometimes I feel like I'm talking to a lot of men these days where I think you can feel there's something bubbling because all the things you've talked about in this conversation, the deep state apparatus, the deep state control, something is building. Whether it explodes in my lifetime, I have no idea, but something is building. I think maybe you and I are the same mindset. We want to know how the story ends. I don't think we know yet because we've yet to experience anything like this. The fact is that history gives us no case that I know of, of any sort of democratic republic under a constitutional structure with a society that largely believes that it's entitled to rule public life and be in charge on a democratic basis that has been secretly ruled by an administrative class of permanent power holders that are completely immune from any kind of electoral control. In a time in which there is mass development of incredulity and even hatred towards the ruling regime. We don't know how that story ends. We saw how totalitarianism ended in Germany. We saw how it ended in the old Soviet Union. We've seen how juntas occur in Latin America. We know how authoritarian governments go down because the people get upset and eventually unseat the bad guys. We don't know how this particular story ends because we have no historical precedent for it. That is a fair statement, and I agree completely. We don't know, but something is unfolding. I agree. Jeffrey, where can we send people? Where's the best place for people to go check you out? Look, if they can't find you, uh, they probably got something wrong with their, uh, their synapses up there somewhere. But where's the best place for them to check you out? Brownstone.org. That's where I, I write daily for the Epoch Times, and I think everybody should subscribe. But I also write for Brownstone, and I'm the editor and the founder and the president of that. And you can get on the email list. We send one a week whenever I get around to it. <laughs> we have a tiny staff of three. <laughs> we are not funded by the Cokes, by the way, <laughs> contrary to what's all over the internet this morning. <laughs> In fact, the Cokes called me in the early days and offered me money contingent upon becoming part of their public health program. And I said, look, I'm glad to take your money, but I know exactly what Brownstone is and I don't need your help. There's more and more people like you, perhaps like myself, that there might be a bag of money that you can pick up somewhere. But if you pick up that bag of money, that internal compass that you have might get smashed by the owner of the bag of the money. So yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> I don't get a salary from Brownstone at all. And I don't plan to. You're just chasing the truth. I think people can feel that. I don't know what people think they're going to do with money. What are you going to do with money? My computer works. I pay my cell phone bill. You know, I've got an apartment with a sofa and a refrigerator. I'm fine. I don't need all this nonsense. I don't understand this idea that people sell out their principles for money. It's just bizarre to me. What am I going to do? Go get on a yacht this weekend? I'm just like, the whole thing is ridiculous. So I don't understand how it is that money rules the world. I've never understood that. But Brownstone's poor. Every donation we get goes entirely to helping people who have been displaced in the course of this pandemic and for educational purposes. And that's it. And it's the cleanest nonprofit. It's funny, there's a big attack on us yesterday by some investigative journalist, and he looked at our 990s. He's announced to the world that we're dark money funded, that we only have nine donors. Okay, well, I don't know about that number nine. That's a little bit interesting because the 990s from 2021 only cover August to December. And we had only been open four months. So did only nine people give me money? Maybe that's right. I don't know. When the critics come out, it's like with the way the news cycles go, people forget whatever crazy criticisms come out within 24 hours. Well, I'm not even going to respond to it because it's so dumb. But I checked our Salesforce install yesterday, just precisely how many donors. The actual number is 4,000. Jeffrey, I've kept you too long. Thank you for coming on again. It's been a few years since we spoke, but this was a fun conversation. I think you gave a great synopsis for people to remember and recall what's happened in the last handful of years, because it's an important time and you give a clear perspective. So thank you very much. Good podcasts require great interviewers. That's 90% of it. And you've done a great job today. I'm really looking forward to sending this out. Thank you, sir. We'll talk again. All the best.
I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.